Thank you very much, and it's uh, ambassadors, Reverend Father, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your welcome. And it's a pleasure to be here at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. And uh, I didn't expect to be the headline act for the beginning of the new decade. But I'm happy to be here this morning. Um, it's, as has been said, it's the first visit to the United States as Trade Commissioner. Uh, it's the first of what I expect will be many visits to Washington. Uh, as European Trade Commissioner, and of course, as an Irishman coming to the United States, you feel very much at home. Um, I had a very busy few days here already, and uh, a lot of meetings scheduled today, meeting members of the administration, members of the Senate, members of the Congress, uh, and key think tanks and people who think they're think tanks, to have ideas about what's going on. Uh, and uh, these are very important meetings from terms of outreach and dialogue and understanding each other and where the European Union is coming from. And uh, the meetings that I've had are in the main very positive and productive, and they confirm that there are powerful and uh, influential voices on both sides of the Atlantic calling for political leadership to refresh, to recalibrate, and generally reclaim the shared agenda on trade between the United States and the and, and if we go about this in the right way, working together, the mutual benefits can be very significant. But if we fail to do so, the damage will be significant also. Uh, not alone for us both, but for the world we have built together. So we are entering this decade at a pivotal moment in time, and we are faced with many challenges, many of which are totally new. It is important that we make the right choices now in the direction we go. And the choice above all is this. We either cooperate and shape the response to these challenges together, or these challenges will shape, divide, and diminish us. So ladies and gentlemen, you are all very familiar with our, sh our rich shared history of global leadership in the trade arena, but in many other areas as well. The United States and the European Union are each other's most important partner. And we have for decades shared an international outlook and values that are rooted in our intertwined history. Together we shape the global trading system and the multilateral institutions that govern it. And this has allowed us to build an economic partnership that has become the most significant commercial artery in the world. And together we formed the largest and wealthiest global market with overall trade in goods and services, worth over 1.3 trillion annually. Working together, we have been the engine of sustained global prosperity for many decades. But the sands of global trade are shifting, and the last decade in particular has seen fundamental shifts. Trade pol politics is no longer exclusively about trade policy. It is often a proxy for security, technology, geopolitics, and more. In particular, trade has become a tool in the global struggle for technological supremacy. Other more general megatrends have accelerated at a rate of knots, such as digitalization and technological advances, the rise of China, climate change, global demographic shifts, and a recognition of the impact of international trade on workers and farmers. The combined weight of these changes means we are now experiencing a high-pressure crisis, a high-pressure crisis moment for the international trading system. However, as we know, diamonds are made under pressure. And the EU is treating this as an opportunity to crystallize our priorities and to assert them on the world stage. I sincerely hope that the United States is thinking along the same lines. In the European Union, we are, we are not going to retreat into our shell at this critical moment in international relations. We're very much open for business, and we believe in the opportunity of openness. New U European Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen is taking a strong geopolitical approach to all of our policy work. And she has given a clear commitment that we need a positive, balanced, and mutually beneficial trading and partnership with the United States. And she has given a clear commitment that we need to elaborate on how we can move a little faster in that direction. First of all, in the interest of transparency and fair play, we need to measure our trade relationship with the right metrics. It's always good to know where the starting position is. We must call out the narrative that the United States has a trade deficit or an unfair trading relationship with the European Union. 
In reality, the relationship is both balanced and highly mutually beneficial. And this cannot be stated enough. In fact, the, the facts are clear. Our tariffs in the United States and the European Union are very similar. On industrial tariffs, our weighted average applied tariff is 1.4%. The United States tariff on the EU is 1.6%. The inclusion of agriculture, which many politicians are looking for in any negotiations between the European Union and the United States, changes the picture very slightly. The EU weighted average on all US imports stands at 3% if you include agriculture, whilst the US tariff in EU imports at 2.4%. So these are figures that I wanted to give you in order to show that the, narrative, the narrative of what has been said about this massive deficit is actually misplaced. The modern economy thrives on goods, services, and investment, and each of these creates jobs and salaries for American workers. The US is a services-led economy. In fact, the US is the global services powerhouse. American services exports to the European Union amount to $256 billion in 2018, a surplus of $60 billion, all of it strongly supporting jobs and wealth right here in the United States of America. On top of that, American companies in the European Union send back $123 billion to the United States every year. So transatlantic trade in goods and services is worth over $3 billion a day. So it sounds like a fairly healthy relationship in trade terms to me. Mutual investment is another pillar of the transatlantic economy. And in the last decade alone, the, United, the European Union has attracted over 58% of total US foreign investment. US companies freely choose to invest more in the European Union than in other, any other markets combined, and that in all other markets combined. This is a highly profitable enterprise for American companies who have an investment stock in Europe of $3.6 trillion. Of course, this all also applies in the other direction. 60% of foreign investment in the United States comes from the European Union. It should be noted too that 66% of all EU imports require further processing and further production in the United States, which means more jobs in the United States. This is never taken into account in any of the, the trade narrative that I hear about. So why then would you be putting tariffs on these European products that are needed for further processing and production and for jobs in the United States to make them more expensive for your people, more expensive for your business. And this damages employment, and damages economic activity in the medium term. So we can say beyond any doubt that the transatlantic economic relationship is a balanced one. It's a multi-layered one. And above all, one is very beneficial to both sides. These are important facts that should be fostered and strengthened. The European Union is a free and open market, offering a level playing field to US companies. That's why they're there, 500 million people. Other partners do not do so, because the transatlantic supply chains allow companies in the European Union and the US to operate more efficiently together and secure millions of jobs on both sides of the Atlantic, 16 million jobs at the last count. No other market is as free and open for US business as the EU. Where else are you as welcome? I might add, I'm coming under pressure to defend this level of openness, given that our European business can be hit with unjustified tariffs and restrictions at a moment's notice. But I want to be clear that we reject the US labeling the EU as a security risk in order to justify the imposition of tariffs. The narrative is, is hurtful to our European people. The EU is absolutely committed to a strong and positive bilateral agenda. And I'm here this week to try and develop that positive agenda. The executive working group that was established by President Trump and President John Claude Juncker in July 2018 has done some good work. It has reduced tensions and encouraged cooperation in both the bilateral agenda and global challenges. From our side, we are already delivering some results. Take, for example, our increase in imports of American soya beans, which President Trump likes, and liquefied natural gas. This increase in imports is good for US farmers and exporters, but also for energy diversification and agriculture in the EU. So it's a good example of a win-win. But improvements in trade should not be one way. 
So the EU has been patient for many years, since 2008, to receive approval for the modest exportation of apples and pears to the United States from the European Union. And I'm often asked to explain the scientific basis of why certain products are blocked from access to the European Union by the United States. I would question the scientific basis for blocking the approval of apples and pears as well into the United States after 12 years. So Europe is a major export destination for our United States farmers. Last year we imported some $14 billion of American agricultural products. In fact, we like your products so much that agri-food imports from the United States are the fastest growing EU imports. In addition, we granted the EUS exclusive use of 35,000 tonnes of our import quota for hormone-free beef. We adjusted that quota to, at the request of the United States, and we did it with a good heart. This is out of a total of 45,000 tonnes of beef that comes in hormone-free into the European Union, and this is operational from the 1st of January 2020. So these are good news stories, but we are ambitious for more. And we want to finalize our negotiations on issues of a United States concern, where they have put on the table issues around conformity assessment, which is a long-standing ask of the United States. We want to discuss tariffs and how we can reduce tariffs, but also reduce non-tariff barriers. We need more convergence in relation to standards and in the regulatory field through greater cooperation. This is the best way for both of us to be rule makers instead of rule takers. Ongoing negotiations and these are important, and if we don't work together on these issues, somebody else and some other country will do it. We are keen to intensify our cooperation on technology, covering areas as semiconductors, artificial intelligence, additive manufacturing, and quantum technology. This cooperation will be massively important for our economies and our security in the future. And the European Union followed the US example and introduced its own investment screening mechanism in recent times, and we're eager to learn from the experiences of the United States in relation to export control and investment screening, to name but a few. So we can protect our trusted transatlantic trade and investment space, and we should have discussions on a possible agreement to whitelist each other when it comes to investment and export controls. But we recognize these are only the first steps. We need to cooperate much more closely on the technologies that are transforming our economies in order to protect our trusted trading space. The EU agrees on the importance of telecom network security, particularly in relation to 5G. The European Commission, in fact, published an EU-wide risk assessment in October 2019 in respect of this area. And this month, the EU and the Member States will present a toolbox of mitigating measures to address these risks. This work will provide a good foundation for future transatlantic cooperation, an area of great concern to this administration. So we're laying the foundation of our, for our shared future for decades to come by openly discussing these issues with our friends in the United States. However, we must also deal with the disputes of the present day. Imposing tariffs on each other serves nobody's long-term interest. Tariffs are in reality just another form of taxation on businesses and consumers. There are no winners in a trade war. You don't have to take my word for it. The Federal Reserve study released last month by the United States shows that the import tariffs imposed to protect U.S. manufacturers have had the opposite effect by raising input costs and by triggering retaliatory tariffs. This reduces economic growth, reduces wages, and puts jobs at risk. It's hardly a sensible approach. In this regard, I regret the choice of the United States to move ahead with tariffs in the Airbus case and the recent announcement to potentially subject additional EU products to tariffs. This leaves the European Union with no alternative but to follow through in due course with our own tariffs in relation to the Boeing case, which will be announced in May or June by the, at the WTO where the United States has been found in breach of WTO rules, rules. And we have a joint responsibility to resolve this, and we have offered to do so by negotiation. We've made proposals. We haven't got really any response yet. But we are open to sitting down and negotiating a balanced settlement so that we can leave these disputes behind us. And the EU has shared concrete proposals, as I said, with the United States on how we can do that. 
We have clearly identified aircraft subsidies and on future support to our respective aircraft sectors. If we don't solve this issue, China will help to grow its business in civil aviation at the expense of the European Union and the United States. Now is the time that we can defend the position of both the United States and the EU aircraft sectors in a market with strong emerging players. If we continue to beat each other up, then the future risks being lost to the new competitors. Finding agreement is also essential in relation to our modern and connected economies. People in the America and the, and the European Union want digital companies to contribute their fair share of tax on both sides of the pond. Of course, how we do that is what we're negotiating at the OECD. And we need to find a sustainable answer to this problem if we want to prevent every country coming up with its own individual solution. So we have made it clear that we have no option but to regulate on our own if the US blocks a global agreement through the OECD. So ladies and gentlemen, we are operating in a changing global economy, and in Europe we remain absolutely convinced and unwavering in our conviction that an open trading system with a firm and fair rule book is the best hope for every country around the world to achieve its a sustainable economic progress. Global challenges, in my view, need global rules. Unfortunately, the current rule book is out of date, and the rules-based multilateral system has drifted away from economic and business realities. The gap in the multilateral rule book has allowed China to provide significant subsidization that distorts markets and investment flows. By creating overcapacity in certain sectors, China's state-owned enterprises are in a position to outbid others in government procurement or in acquisitions. This means it can ex exploit its role as a key investment destination to siphon off technology by forcing giant ventures or requiring disclosure of trade secrets in order to get licenses. China has been able to do all of this while maintaining closed markets that allow its own operators to grow by putting up internal barriers to foreign operators, such as complex licensing requirements and discriminatory licensing conditions. That is why the WTO reform is a top European priority. We fully agree with the United States that the organization needs to be fixed, and it needs a profound overhaul, not just tweaking at the margins. Rule making is paralyzed and transparency is underused, and the current rule book does not adequately address some of the most trade distorting measures, such as industrial subsidies. And this week, the United States, the European Union, and Japan came together in a joint statement to reflect this reality and her concern and her ability to work together. It's probably the first time that those three entities were in a photograph together for a while, uh, and hopefully it's the start of something new. But we have to step up our cooperation, and we need a new balance to be found in the WTO, with clear rules and commitments that properly regulate global trade, after all, as an organization that's 25 years old. We need to establish a level playing field that reflects the world of today, a diverse global economy more connected and technologically driven than ever before. Our objective is to return the WTO to the center of global trade where it belongs. That is why we urgently need to fix the negotiating function of the organization. And for this, it is a total no-brainer because the organization has been unable to create new rules or adapt existing ones for far too long. I therefore warmly welcome what we did this week to try and deal with the issues of industrial subsidies and forced technology transfer together and to deal with the distorting trade, uh, the distorting issues that are hampering the cooperation that's necessary in the rule book on global trade. It shows what can be done if we work together. Rights and obligations in the system should be rebalanced and at a minimum I think we can probably agree that the so-called emerging countries like China have emerged. This means that a fresh look is needed at the question of exceptions for developing countries, which should only be available where and when needed. A broad exception for two-thirds of WTO members is not acceptable. So we are in agreement with the United States on this, and we need to define the appropriate way to get there. The WTO will need to change the way it works, negotiates, and decides. The hostage-taking and consensus-blocking attitude will not work anymore and we need mechanisms to facilitate the integration of plurilateral approaches in the WTO framework. This would introduce a new dynamic into the organization and be crucial for several negotiations that are important in the future, such as e-commerce. But I repeat, what would be the value of new rules without a proper enforcement mechanism? 
We therefore need an effective dispute settlement system that enforces the rules as we have agreed them. Nobody can play the global game in trade without a good referee. To our American friends, my message is very simple. Let's talk, let's cooperate, let's lead. We will approach any discussions in WTO reform with an open mind, and we have made proposals to address these concerns of the United States recently, and we now need clarity in relation to what the United States actually wants. The time has come to start discussions in earnest, and our strong preference is to tackle WTO reform on the basis of transatlantic cooperation. But if the United States does not wish to engage in this work, the European Union will have to strike out on its own with other partners. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by once more wishing you a happy new year and a happy new decade. And I remain hopeful, after my visit here this week, that the 2020s can be an era of refreshed and resurgent transatlantic relationships. We have a strong and proactive trade agenda in the European Union. I can assure you that we will be no shrinking violets. We will robustly defend our European interests. But let us recall that our primary interest and the job we are here to do on both sides of the Atlantic is to protect the interests and well-being of our people and our economies. American and European companies are relying on open markets, and if we fail to protect them in our economies, it will be our economies, our workers, and our citizens who will end up paying the price. The European Union and the United States are sometimes described as siblings, and I have to say I agree with this observation. But as you know, siblings often bicker. They call each other names from time to time. They even get into a fight, but let's not forget that when the pressure comes, siblings are family, and we always end up supporting each other. So I hope that we can get back to seeing matters eye to eye as a family, and this is the world's best hope for a peaceful and prosperous future. Thank you.